Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is David Naylor from the Department of Mechanical and Industrial Engineering at Ryerson University. I'm doing this uh, little primer on using D2L for online quizzes, perhaps to help faculty members make the transition, perhaps for their final assessment, an online quiz of some sort. So this is my course, uh, MEC 110, Energy of the Environment. I have some online assessments. What I'm going to do today is I'm going to walk through setting up a quiz, show you how to prepare a couple of uh, question types that are commonly used in engineering, show you how to preview the quiz, talk a little bit about sharing of uh, question types between instructors, and then, uh, yeah, that'll wrap it up. Okay, so to get to the quiz, of course, it's assessment, assessment, quizzes. Okay, and I already have uh, my final assessment that I've been working on here. Uh, I won't work with that one. I'll make a new one. So we'll go to a new quiz, which I'll just call demo. Now, one of the things you're going to want to do is, uh, so now we're into a new quiz called demo, is you're going to want to add some instructions for the students. I have some standard instructions here. I usually prepare them in Word ahead of time. I'm doing this on a separate screen. I'm going to copy paste a set of instructions in here. And here's some inst you know, quiz instructions. Of course, they'd be unique to your particular quiz. Uh, you can have a look at them. You'll see they show up when I preview the quiz later on. So it gives some instructions about whether they're allowed to backtrack and group work and you know how accurate they need to answer questions in terms of significant digits. The rest of these fields down here are not very important. Uh, disabling Right click has to do, I think, with a Mac and not being able to print, but you can screen capture, so uh, there's probably not much point in disabling that. Okay, so here's where you add questions, but let's hold off on adding questions for the moment. Let's talk about these other tabs across the top, setting up the quiz. So let's go to restrictions here. Uh, the first thing up here is hide from users. You probably want the quiz hidden from so the students don't see it in their list. They, send you emails wondering what the heck it is. They won't be able to access it depending upon your access availability, but it's probably a good idea that, you know, while you're working on it, they don't even see it. So you, you can unclick this afterwards so the students can see it. I don't worry about due date too much, but for an exam or for a quiz that's worth marks, I set an availability start and end date. So for example, with our current crisis, I have a student that's gone home to India, and so I'll probably make my final exam available for 12, 24 hours. So I'll have a have it available for, from one day to the same time at the next day. So he's not writing the exam at three in the morning in India. So I can set my availability here. I won't do it right now. Okay, so coming down here, uh, I'm going to have my quiz for uh, 90 minutes. So you can set the amount. I don't know why the default's 120. But you you don't want to have recommended time. You want to have enforced time limit. Otherwise, the student can work on it for an indefinite amount of time, which is probably not good for a final assessment. So I'm going to say 90 minutes. And you have a grace period here. The default's five minutes. I usually set a short grace period, but don't tell the students about it. <laughs> These radio buttons down here are about what happens after the student goes past the grace period. Uh, you don't want to allow the student to continue working. I prevent the student from making further, further changes so after they go past 95 minutes. I actually tell them in the instructions that they get zero if they go past just, just so they wrap it up. But uh, I don't push it right to the end. But that's what I actually do. I prevent the students from making further changes. Now down here uh, is special access. These are uh, This is really helpful. It's useful for, of course, test center students, students that have accommodations for extra time, and it's really well set up for this. So if you click on Add Users to Special Access, I might have to blur some of this out. Uh, you have full access to the uh, full class list. I'll we'll blur these out here, these uh, student numbers. But let's suppose uh, this student right here, I want to give special access. I want to give them time and a half, for example. So I select them. I can change their accessibility dates if I want. Usually they're the same. It's usually a, but you can change it as you want. Uh, you can have the timing the same or different. 
So if it was an access center, I'd say enforced timing. And if it was, say, time and a half, you know, 120 minutes, you can assign a different uh, grace period. So you've got control over all those timing issues for an access center student. So uh, let's add special access for that student. So now you can see the student's name down here. I'll blur that out or block it out for privacy reasons. But you can always go back in here on this and, and change their special access parameters if necessary. Now, what this is also really useful for is if a student has an issue, like loses internet or something. I tell the students ahead of time that if they lose the internet, they should screen capture their air or their computer locks up, screen capture the error, send me an email, and I can go in here and I can set up special access for them so they have access for another hour to do the test or whatever they need. So it's really useful for that sort of thing. So that's special access. It's under the restrictions tab on editing your quiz. The next thing is assessment. You probably want to have your quiz auto graded. You know, the nice thing about doing all this work is you'll do a lot of work up front, but there won't be all the exam marking. So you want to have your quiz auto graded and you want to ahead of time in your grade book, set up a, a you know, a final assessment grade, and then you can link it to that. So mine is this final assessment. And what's going to happen now is when the student completes the quiz, the grade will automatically get entered into the into the grade book and you won't have to do it. So automatically export grades for sure. And of course, any sort of test. If it was a formative type of uh, where you were, you, a student could try the quiz over and over again, you know, it didn't wasn't for marks or something, you could have more than one attempt, but you only want one attempt, of course, here. Okay, I don't use objectives and I don't use report setup. But submission view is a kind of important. This is what the student, this sets what the student sees after the quiz is over. I think, and you can check this, one of the things you're probably going to want to do is set up a, get CCS to set up a dummy account so you can go in and run this, run the quiz as a, if it's an exam, you'll definitely want to do this. Run the quiz as a dummy student so you can see what they see. So you can make sure you don't accidentally release results right after. So uh, normally students don't see anything, uh, but you can set up additional views so you can have them, you know, you could tell them what their score was that they got, you know, 19 out of 20 or whatever. Uh, you can set it up. Another reason why you would want to use this is after the whole exam is over, since we're all off campus, you want to give the students access to their final exam so they can see how they did, what questions they got right, what questions they got wrong. If you click on additional view, we'll call this post exam view, you can put in something here about, you know, marks were adjusted or whatever, a little note to the students. And then you can set this, you know, maybe May 1st at some time, whatever time you want. And then you can set what the students can see. Yeah, they can see uh, their results. You can even limit how long they can view it. Uh, you can show the answers they, they got incorrect. You can show the answers they got right. You know, you can have a look at this. You can show the class average if you want, uh, and you can show the statistical distribution of the mark. It's up to you as an instructor. So save that. And that shows up as an additional view, post-exam view. Uh, okay, so the quiz has all been set up. We haven't added any questions to it yet. So let's go back to properties. So here's where you add questions. Now, you can, if you're in a tearing rush, you can just click on this and add 10 or 20 questions quickly as you need. That's fine. It'll work. But it doesn't give you very much flexibility. I'm going to show you what I think is a better way. I've been doing this for four years. And doing that ends up tying your hands a little bit. And there's some, if you're in a rush and it's all you're going to do, then you're only ever going to do one of these. You might do it that way. But let me show you what a better way is. It uses what's called the question library. The way you get to the question library is under assessment and then quizzes. And here, here we can see question library. So we click on question library and you'll see I have, I've been working on my, uh, my, my exam. So I have multiple choice questions from after the midterm, multiple choice questions from before the midterm. And the reason I've set them up like this is because when I run my exam, I might want to pick, you know, three questions from, uh, you know, maybe three questions from pre-midterm and most of the other questions from the post-midterm. 
And if you put them all in one one bunch, then when you have the questions randomly selected, in in theory, they could get they could get most of the pre midterm material, which you really don't want. So there's some advantages to setting up these categories. Uh, they're actually called section sections. So what I'm going to do is show you first how to make a section. So let's just make a little section. So you can make questions here. And I have a question here. I've got one question. But these, these ones with little folders are all sections. So let's just make a section called Demo Questions. Uh, I don't think you need to put any information in there. OK, and let's go into here and make a couple of questions. Uh, you can play with the different question types. I'm going to show you the two that I use. The first one and the easiest one, of course, is multiple choice. And I usually prepare my multiple choice questions ahead of time in uh, Word, and then I copy them over. So here's one. Here's a silly one. You know, what color is the sky? And then you can have your various options, blue, green, red. And of course, if you only have three answers, of course, you have to tell it which one you think is right. And if you want uh, less, an less answers, you can have, click on there. If you want more answers, there you go. You can, you can add a graphic in here just from my computer. Drop into there. If you add a graphic, it will make you uh, put in an alternate text for uh, people who are vision impaired. Uh, I guess I imported that before, so I'll overwrite it. And you can see it's quite a big graphic, so any graphic can be resized in here as you like. Now, another thing I'll point out at this point is. You know, you can import a graphic. If it's a complicated question with an equation that you don't want to, it has an equation builder, you can import videos and all sorts of, you can build equations. If you don't want to take the time to build equations, you can just make the whole question a graphic. So uh, if you already have it in Word, you just snip the question and put it in as a graphic. So you can randomize the results so the top answer isn't always the right answer. Let's get rid of that one. And then, you know, the default is that each question is worth one point. You can change that. Okay, and so let's preview that. We'll preview that question I just made. And that's the student view. What color is the sky? And they can select whatever they want. And of course, it shows you what it looks like in the grading view. And not for an exam, but if you were doing it as a formative quiz, you could have a hint or a comment. You can have feedback that's specific to the answer they picked. So if they made a common error, you could explain what their common error is. Probably not appropriate on an exam, but in uh, other teaching purposes, that would be helpful, of course. Okay, so that's a multiple choice question. The other question that's a little harder to set up, and that's why I'm going to do it here, is an arithmetic question. In an, ar in, in an arithmetic question, you can have, you set up the question and uh, every student gets a different value of the parameters in the question, so no two students' answer is the same. If you're Answer involves simple numbers, then arithmetic question. If you have scientific notation in your problem, you're going to have to use the significant uh, figures. D2L is really set up badly for scientific notation. So here's the arithmetic question. Let me call this one Newton's second law. Of course, it's you wouldn't put this in for the students because it would kind of give them the answer, but that's F equals MA, force equals mass times acceleration. Points, difficulty level. Let me copy over. I have one already, already prepared here. So I'm copying this from a different screen. Paste. So the question is, what force is required to accelerate a mass of m at a meters per second? An enter your answer in newtons to three-digit accuracy. So you'll notice here that I have little curly brackets. That tells it it's a variable m. And I have little curly brackets that tell it that A is a variable, and numbers are going to get substituted in there that's, that are different for every student. Of course, the answer is F equals MA. You wouldn't put that in the title for the students, of course. So the formula is curly bracket M star curly bracket 
curly bracket A. Uh, and if you're wondering about more complicated formulas, you, can, you have access to other more complex formulas. And if you click on the question mark, you can see them. You've got sine and cos and pi and log and things like that if necessary. And it's entered very much like you would enter in C or in any programming language in Fortran or something like that. You'll find it quite easy to use for most things. Uh, answer precision here, the people who set this up weren't very scientific, so what they mean here is the number of decimal places I found out. So let's say we have the answer to one decimal place. Uh, this is the tolerance, because the student's going to calculate the number, and depending upon the problem, they'll have some round-off error, depending on how much. And I, you know, you might set this to, let's say, 1%. It's up to you. Or you could set an absolute tolerance, you know, plus or minus an absolute tolerance. But usually when you're changing values, you don't want an absolute tolerance. You want to have a percentage. You can set the units the students have to enter in, and you can make it worth points. I don't usually do that. Uh, so here's where you set up the equation now. You have, I have mass, and I have accelerations of my two variables. And you don't put them in with uh, curly brackets here. So let's say the mass varies from 5 to 10 kilograms. I'm going to have it show up in the problem with, with one decimal. So that's, that's how many decimals it'll show in the problem statement. And let's have it vary by... Uh, 0.5 kilograms. So it'll randomly vary this variable from 5 to 10 in increments of 0.5. And let's have the acceleration vary from 2 uh, to 8 meters per second, again with 1, uh, 0.25, let's say. In that case, if you can have 2.5, you better have two decimals. You can put some hints in. None of the other stuff is that important. So now we've got this set up. You can add more variables. If your equation involves three variables, you can add another variable here. So let's test this. So if you hit test of this equation, you can see it picked, it randomly picked M is eight and A is six. Eight times 6.5 is 52. And it gives you the range of acceptable answers, plus or minus 1%. So that seems to be working. So that question is done. Of course, really simple question. So we'll, We'll save it. Let's preview it and just see what it looks like. So here we go, the student view. What force is required to accelerate 7.5 kilograms at 2.75 meters per second? You can see it's got the two digits that I specified. And the student would enter the number in there along with the units of Newtons. And uh, here's the answer. So that's just a preview to make sure you're, you don't have any typos in the question. So those are the two uh, question types. There are other question types. There are fill in the blanks and Likert, and you can play around with them. There's even written response ones where you can put a question in, the student has to enter, can write in a response, but those can't be auto graded. I've never used them myself. So you could play with the different question types. Okay, so we have our demo questions all set up. Okay, the next thing I want to do is I actually want to set up the quiz. So let's talk about adding questions to the quiz because there's some issues here. So let's go back to assessments, quizzes. Here's my uh, final assessment. I'm not going to mess with that. That little symbol here tells me that it's uh, hidden from the students at the moment. And that means I've already granted special access to some test center students. And again, hidden access center. And this tells me I've linked it to my grade item, that little key. So let's go and we, ha we haven't set any questions up yet. So you can either click on it or you can go to edit. And now we're going to add questions. And now, as I said, you could just do that right at the beginning if you want to, but I think in a moment you're going to see uh, how there's some flexibility in this. So I'm going to click Add, Edit. Okay, so there's two options, Add and Import. Since we have our questions in our question library, the first thing I'm going to do is add a question from uh, the question library. So Browse Question Library. And you can pick whatever you want. Let's pick our, our demo questions here. Well, and this extra question that I have. And you can pick from any of the groups, just expand them out. So let's pick these three questions. And there they are. We have our three questions. Now, our, our so far, our quiz is worth three points. But what you might want to do is you might want to make a bank of questions, let's say 20 questions, and have only 10 picked from them. And you might want to have those in different categories, maybe one for each chapter or something. You don't want to, if you set them all, if you put all your questions in one 
grouping, then by random chance, they, they, some poor student could get all the questions from one chapter instead of, so you want to put, you want to, that's the reason you want your uh, uh, question libraries because you can break up your questions in different, in different chapters. Uh, so let me show you how to do a random selection so we can pick a random, that's done with add. Question pool. What question pool? That's that's talking about the picking random questions from a question pool. They should have named that slightly better, I understand. So let's go question pool. Now you can see number of questions to select. And let's put in here random post midterm. These are the, the post midterm questions. I'm going to pick a random number from them. So I'm not going to put the number in here yet. We're going to go browse the library. Now, in my post midterm questions so far, I have one, two, three, four, five questions. I'm going to have a lot more eventually. I'm still working on it. Uh, oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. There's 14 questions total. There's only five. So let's suppose we select all of these five questions. Now I can tell D2L that I want to pick three of those five questions randomly, and every student will get a slightly different variation of those of those five questions. Well, they get three of the five randomly picked. And so now my quiz has uh, a total of six questions, these three questions, and three random ones from uh, my question library from the post midterm material. So that takes you through. That's pretty much a setup quiz. Let's go back to the uh, settings here. We've done all our settings. Oh, the other thing you want to do is you probably want to shuffle the questions at the quiz level. So what'll happen is that uh, you know, the first question here, did you ever attend lecture? I'll show you that question in a minute. May not be the first question for, you don't want it to be the first question for every student. They're going to get random, uh, these questions presented to them in a random order, and the answers are going to be randomized, right? So we get both kinds of randomization. So you want to shovel it, shuffle at the quiz level. I usually like to let students move back and forwards through pages. So if they think, oh, I got question two, you know, they, 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 after they think a bit more, they get question two wrong, they can go back to it and fix it. So I usually leave that unchecked. Okay, so we can save and close. Now, the last thing you probably want to do, well, let's make it visible, visible to users. And the last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to preview it. Now, this previews it as a student in a sort of way. I don't think it's the best way to do this. I think if for for an exam, I'd recommend you get a dummy account from CCS and you actually go in as a student. And then you can see that everything works, that you do the questions and the grade gets exported to the grade book and you can see what your post quiz view is. So you can't act, so you haven't accidentally released all the questions to the first student. You know, you should go in and do that. I, I, I It's just a, you know, double check. But this is a good preliminary check. You can go in here and preview the quiz. So you can see, so we're, we're bypassing restrictions. So if the quiz is set to be unavailable yet, you're bypassing all that stuff. You can see my instructions that I posted in. Uh, yeah, and so I can start the quiz. What color is the sky, et cetera. You can enter a number there. Uh, this is a question I really liked from my one of my faculty members. I probably won't use it this year because it's uh, this is a, uh, you know, open book off. They can search the internet and look, but <laughs> did you ever attend lecture? Who is the instructor in this course? That was one of my, these are the, all of these people, by the way, are David Naylor, uh, my name. <laughs> and then uh, you, uh, when you're done, you can pick, so I'm going to pick an answer to each one of these. Uh, you can submit the quiz and you can allow it, the preview to be sent to the grading area if you want to, to see that the grade goes. I don't know where it goes in this case because you're not a dummy student. So I, I, it puzzles me there. Okay, a couple other little things. Let's go in here and just edit this quiz again. One other functionality thing you can do here is here's, here, here are all the questions. If you wanted to have one point, you know, a particularly hard question worth two points, for example, you can edit the values and you can make, you know, did you ever attend lecture worth two points if you want to instead of one point. You can have a difficulty level for each question if you want to. This just tells you the type, multiple choice, that's arithmetic. This is a randomly picked. You can have a question that's a bonus. You can force them to answer all the questions if you want to. Uh, so that's how you adjust the points. One of my faculty members asked how you, uh, if you can make uh, a wrong question 
a penalty. I don't know if you can do that. Uh, so you'll have to phone CCS Digital Media Projects if, to ask how they do that. I've never done it. I'm not a big fan of that, but I don't know if you can make a wrong answer, or penalize them for a wrong answer. Okay, so that's, that's the last little thing almost. Let me just go out to one extra thing. If you're team teaching with somebody and you know, you're, you want to have the same exam, you can share questions. You can both make questions up in the question library. So remember, question library is under assessment, quizzes, question library. So you could make up some questions. Your colleague could make up some questions, and then you could share them. And you share them in the course admin over here. So course admin, and then it's through import export. So when you go to, you can select whether you want to import or export components, and you can select which components when you go through this process. I'm not going to carry on with this, but you can select, you know, that you want to export your, your quizzes and your, uh, the questions in your, in your question library, and then they get exported to your hard drive as a zip file, and you can share that zip file and upload it, and then do the, do the opposite, you know, do the import. And that way you can both have the same set of questions and the same quiz. Is there anything else? I think that covers pretty much the whole thing. Yeah. Uh, well, I hope you've, uh, that's sort of a quick primer on setting up online assessments in D2L. I uh, hope you found that useful. Bye for now.